Coming up, Renewalist Christians in America. What I saw was that learning to experience God in this intimate way is a skill. It's something that people learn to acquire. Stanford's T.M. Lerman gives an inside look at the psychology and politics of evangelical Christianity in the United States. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Our speaker, Tanya Lerman, will be discussing her widely acclaimed book, When God Talks Back, Understanding the American Evangelical Relationship with God. When God Talks Back is a book that takes an unusual approach to understanding the American evangelical experience as it combines Tanya's skills as both an anthropologist and her background in psychology with a commitment to understanding evangelicals not merely as scholarly specimens, but on their own terms. Tanya began researching the American evangelical experience by attending weekly services at the Vineyard Christian Fellowship Church in Chicago. I've always been fascinated by the question of how God becomes real for people. I grew up as a kind of spiritual mutt uh, my, my parents go to a Unitarian church, but my mother's father was a Baptist minister. And so on that side of my family, all my cousins are people that you would call fundamentalist Christians. My father, the doctor, grew up in a Christian science household, and I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood just outside of New York City. And so I knew all of these wise, good people who had very different understandings of ultimate reality. And about 10 years ago, I set out to try to understand, you know, I set out to look for a religion that was the most in-your-face challenge to, or seemed to create the greatest cognitive burden for your belief, the, the kind of faith that would seem to make it mo most difficult to commit to the, the, the nature of God. And I found it in charismatically oriented evangelical Christianity. These are churches in which God is high and mighty and distant and worthy, but God is also a person among people. He cares about your haircut. He wants to know where you're going to go on summer vacation. He wants to hear you grouse about the things that you talk to your spouse about. And he's also supernaturally powerful. He can kind of you know, zap into your life with a thunderbolt and change the questions on an exam or change. He can make the plane, your plane, run on time. I mean, he will do things that are practical in your world. Um, these folks are not the lunatic left fringe. Something like 40% of our country describe themselves as evangelical or born again. About half of that number, roughly a quarter of all Americans, could be described as renewalist Christians. These are people who seek to have an interactive, supernatural, back and forth relationship with God. I joined um, this, this, uh, such a church. Um, I, I wanted to know how people were able to experience God in this way. I wanted to know how people were able to experience this invisible agent as a person among people. And so about 10 years ago, I joined an evangelical church that was in, in my neighborhood hung out there for two years, went to the Sunday morning gatherings, participated in a weekly house group, went to local meetings and national meetings, um, hung out with people, had coffee, interviewed people. And then I moved to California and found another church, just like the Chicago church, and repeated the same activity. What I saw was that learning to experience God in this intimate way is a skill. It's something that people learn to acquire. You can tell it's a skill because people show up in the church and they say things like, you know, they believe in God, but, you know, God doesn't talk to me. You know, please, so-and-so, will you pray to God for me because God doesn't talk back to me? And six months later, maybe nine months later, they'll say something like, I recognize God's voice the way I recognize my mom's voice on the phone. They talk as if they really feel they recognize God as a person in their lives. So the church teaches them three things to enable them to recognize God as a person among people. First of all, it teaches them to think about their minds differently. I think about this as, a, as acquiring a new theory of mind. People learn to think about their minds not just as a private place where only, they, only their thoughts dwell, but as, as a place with permeable borders. God can move in and out of the mind, and your job as a congregant is to pick out the thoughts and images and impressions that God may be placing within your mind, not your thoughts, the word of God to you. 
And so the, the uh, church teaches people how to discern the presence of these thoughts. Um, people often learn to, to experience these thoughts uh, by praying for somebody else. If I were to pray for somebody, this fine woman who was weeping in need of prayer, I would have my hand on her shoulders and my eyes would be closed and I would be looking for the images and thoughts and words that came to my mind that would be appropriate for her. And I might have the experience that a certain image, like a calla lily or a rose or a, or a, or a daisy might, calla lilies are a California image, a daisy might come to mind and I would, I would say that I, I see a daisy in this. And it might be that the person that I'm praying for would, say, would feel that that was the perfectly suited image to represent her experience, that she was a wildflower growing in the field or something like that. When people, sometimes the, the experience is much more specific Somebody will have an image of a baby and the person will be pregnant and they were, didn't know they were pregnant and it's a great moment of excitement for the parties. The second thing the church invites you to do is to pretend that God is present. That sounds, you know, people don't really think of this as, as pretense. Uh, Let's pretend is the, is the title of a, of a chapter of mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis's book, arguably one of the most important theological texts of the 20th century. And Lewis tells us that we should pretend in order to experience in reality. This is a world in which the pastor told the congregation to put out a second cup of coffee for God in the morning. So you have your own cup of coffee, and you should pour a second real cup of coffee um, and leave it for God. And, uh, and that will give you, you know, make you feel more like you really are talking to God over the, over the coffee. People go on dates with God. Women go on dates with God. They go, you know, somebody will pick up a sandwich and go to the park and kind of sit on a park bench. And the woman who's, who was telling me the story said that, you know, she and God were just sitting on the park bench together and his arm was around her shoulders and she was telling him about her life and he was telling her about his. And when people do this, um, it's hard for them. Uh, they have to, just as they have to get out over the idea that all of their thoughts are mere human thoughts, they have to get over the idea that this is a mere daydream. But over time, they feel more comfortable with the idea that the, the, this experience of being with God, pretending that God is present, actually gives them a greater confidence that God is actually there walking by their side. The third thing they do, they do what I call a series of emotional practices, which you can see as an anthropologist. Uh, you see people perform in church, and you see people come into the church and, and learn to perform themselves. In this daydream-like interaction with God that people call prayer, people learn to hear from God um, what, that, what advice a therapist would give them. They do things like crying in the presence of God. So in church, at the end of a Sunday morning, you'll see that people, about a quarter of the church, a quarter, a third, something like that, in the churches where I was spending time, they'd come up to the front of the church for prayer. And, you know, and other people in the church would come up to the front and pray for them. And you would see distributed around the, ch around the church groups of people. And there's somebody in the center who's typically, typically crying because people cry in the presence of God. And there are people around them with their hands on their shoulders talking to them um, or praying. And what you see is in that kind of setting is that the human person who's doing the praying is standing in for the presence of God. They, uh, the person is crying because in some ways they feel inadequate or something's gone wrong. And the person around them, people around them are saying some version of, may so-and-so feel wrapped in the arms of, love, of your embrace, may, they, may so-and-so know the, the infinite depth of your love, may so-and-so, I mean, and there's a sense in which your job as a person praying is to speak the words that God should, would be speaking to the person who was in the middle of, of, of the circle. So the God that emerges from these interactions is a very striking God. God is very particular to the person who is experiencing God. People, I used to think of this as a mapping and remapping process. So that people would, in order to represent God, I mean, in order, you know, you've got to use your imagination to experience God because God's not materially present. And what people would do is they would grab hold of their best memories of relationships, the most loving exchanges with their mom or dad or cousins or whatever, 
and they would kind of create an amalgam of that, that, those memories. And they would sort of rework them as they talked about God and what God was doing with them that week and what God was saying to them that week and how they were thinking about God that week, They're constantly talking about God. And they're reworking this representation of God in the weekly house groups, a group of seven, ten people that hang out every week as they listen to the pastor talking in church on Sunday morning, as they hang around having coffee after church. They're reworking this representation and they're seeking to represent God as being purely loving. And churches will push back to, uh, at me when I say that this is an unconditionally loving God, but that was the God that I heard about in church, a God who loved you always and you know, hell did not appear in the churches in which I spent time. And people take this representation of a loving God, and then they try to be who they would be in relationship to this God. And they try to kind of imagine the kind of person that they would be if they truly were loved by this kind of God. And so they kind of map back to themselves the characteristics that they imagine God to have. This kind of God is unique to each person because it's your mess of memories of being loved. It is a person among people so that I think God works. I can't believe that God worked psychologically for people the way that your own memories of parents worked for you psychologically. You kind of carry them around in what, is, what it, a therapist might call an inner object or a self object available for you um, when you're you know, anxious, frightened, morose. Um, if you have a robust internal object, that will buffer you against those, those difficult times. Because it's a complicated object made up of memories and all kinds of things, it can kick you accidentally. You can discover that, in fact, you, you experience a God that's more harsh than you'd imagined. And people talk about being God wounded and needing to work on their God object. And this kind of God can come and go. So people speak sentences like, oh, Prayer was wonderful on Friday. He was really there. You know, Saturday, Sunday, and I just couldn't find him. He just didn't show up. And the phrase, God didn't show up, is a phrase that you'll hear in churches like that. That's what I could see as an anthropologist, as an observer of, of this kind of God. I was also struck by this kind of more psychological dimension. I started to do some experimental work. I started you know, I've got a foot in the psychological domain. I pulled out psychological scales and sat down and I talked to people about their experience of God and their experience of prayer and how long they prayed and what kind of spiritual experience they had. And I gave them a couple of scales. And it turned out that there was a, there was a scale called the absorption scale that's got a bunch, you know, who knows what this thing really picks up. It's got a thir 34 items. You say true or false, does the item apply to you? And there's things like sometimes I like to watch the way clouds change in the sky, or sometimes I experience things the way that I did when I was a child. They seem to be items that capture whether you are comfortable being caught up in your imagination. And that scale predicted or correlated with a bunch of the things that I was interested in in, in church. It pre the, the more highly you scored on the, the absorption scale, the more likely you were to say that you had a back and forth relationship with God the more likely you were to say that you, ha you, you experienced God with your, your senses. And the more likely you were to say that you had these vivid experiences of God and that sometimes God talked back audibly, which happened. And so, uh, and I should say these aud auditory experiences, they're not psychotic experiences. Um, and in fact, these days I spend a lot of my time fretting about the differences between spirituality and psychosis and how how they are similar, but how, we, how, how they are also different. The folks that, when people are psychotic, you know, they, as you know, if they meet, people who meet criteria for schizophrenia, they often have auditory experiences. They hear many, many voices throughout the day. The voices, um, you know, they hear paragraphs and whole conversations. They hear many, many voices. And what those voices say is, is at least in this culture, is usually pretty awful. When people report these auditory experiences of God, they report a handful of experiences. Um, they say things like, you know, God spoke up out of the back seat of the car and said, I will always be with you. Or he sat in the front seat. Lots of these. It's not uncommon for these to happen in cars. Um, you know, I will always love you. Or get off the bus. So, I mean, the, the, the God will say these short little sentences. People experience them as being generated outside of their head. 
Um, and they're startling. People often stop the car and, and sort of shake, and then they cry. Um, but, they're, but they're good experiences. Let me just say a, a word or two about politics, because I know that this is something that this group is interested in. So there's this funny thing um, that happened, which is that uh, the, the folks who founded my church, the Vineyard Christian Fellowship, really did come out of the hippie Christians. They were Jesus freaks. And that particular movement, and the movement that has made this kind of religiosity famous, comes out of the hippie, out of the Jesus freaks. These, you know, these kids who essentially were on the California beaches and they traded out LSD for God somewhere about 1970. And you can ask the question of how that group became more right wing. The way people usually spin that story is that the old time evangelical preachers who were kind of like hanging out on the, you know, in the eddies and the edges of American uh, political life were the ones who encountered these hippie Christians. And as the hippies entered their churches and as the churches exploded and as the churches drew people in because they had a new kind of music and a new kind of intimacy with God, those old time evangelical preachers just took their right wing politics and made them the politics of the group. And that's not an implausible explanation. Um, you can also make the argument that they, these, you know, uh, these uh, old time, these Jesus freaks, you know, hated the government back in 1970, and they and their descendants hate the government now. And you know, the old time hippie Christians became the Tea Party. I don't have any evidence for that except a few an anecdotes. I did want to draw your attention to something that I think um, makes a little more sense of the. Um, some aspects of right-wing evangelical politics for me. And that is this idea of being, being on, a, on, on, on a path with Jesus, walking with Jesus, walking with God. If you're constantly in a relationship with God, I mean, he's literally walking by your side, he's at table fellowship with you, he's, he's someone who is always engaged with you, you imagine yourself as somebody who will be better tomorrow than you are today. You are going to be someone different because God wants you to be someone different. God invites you with him in fellowship so that you become the person that he wants you to be. It is a very easy step from that way of thinking to think that government programs, government aid, is a kind of cheap interruption with that path. It's going to keep you down, it's going to keep you dependent, and it's going to keep you, prevent you from being the person that you want to be. That's not, it's certainly not the case that all evangelicals are right wing. The evangelical community is becoming more and more diverse over time. The particular church that I was in is actually, it would be called by many a progressive evangelical church. There were certainly many Republicans in the, in the churches where I spent time. There were, but you know, we were on the edges of a university town. There were many. There were also many Democrats, and in the particular church where I spent time, politics weren't preached from the pulpit. Although I have been to other churches in which they have been, I think it's important to take seriously that the um, the hesitation to um, government help can, can can be seen to come from a legitimate place within the Christian journey and can seem to be an authentic response to the idea of being in relationship with God. How do you differentiate between it being a religion and a cult? I'm sure this question comes up all the time, right? Uh, well, uh, I, I, I will tell you my cult story. So back when I, when I was assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego, I was I was our university's person on cults. And uh, that was the year that Heaven's Gate uh, became famous because 40 of its members, they lived in a house in which nobody could leave except in pairs. And they decided that they were going to follow God who was coming in on the spaceship after a comet. And so they decided to shed their mortal coil by taking our barbiturates and uh, vodka. And um, we all died. At the time, I was looking for a funky religious group to study, and I'd encountered a particular group, which um, was quite interesting. It had scooped up a lot of Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh's followers. I went to its open meeting. Uh, it was in an, an industrial warehouse. There were 
a huge industrial warehouse. There were like 70 people in the room. We were, we were spread out on the floor. They turned down the lights. They turned up the, the techno throb. They said, said, find your heartache and find God. And everyone in the room except me began, began to sob. I mean, and they began to sob, and they were rolling around on the ground, and they were, you know, and there was, I mean, it was really pretty intense. And, um, you know, and then the music changed to babbling brook music, and then, uh, pe pe then people came, and they began to stroke you, and they, it, they was a pretty weird group. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and so it was so weird that because I, being me, I had a relationship with a clerk at the local occult bookstore, and I went into the, the occult bookstore the next day, and, and I said, so what do you think about this group? And she said, oh, you look into their, this is a woman who was a, a, a member of a Santeria group, an Anglo-Cuban spirit possession group. And this woman said to me, you look into the eyes of those people, there's nobody home. So I tell that as a background because I was our university's person for, on, on cults and weird religious practices. And NPR invites me to come onto a program to talk about the difference between a religion and a cult. The person asking me the questions asked exactly that question. She was from the group that where people were rolling around on the floor. I'm not. <laughs> so no, no, I'm not suggesting. <laughs> but it, I'm just saying that the, the kind of the line between the cult and the religion is, you know, it's a line that everybody draws in their own terms. I can tell you that there's certain phase that make me nervous are phase in which people, you know, don't aren't allowed to leave the group except in pairs, where the, you're not allowed to get an outside viewpoint. That's certainly not true of the evangelical church. Um, I mean, people change churches, you know, every th three to five years in California. Somebody was, I don't know, somebody gave me that figure. I don't, don't know if it's true. Um, it makes me nervous in, uh, in, a, in a church if um, children are treated badly, not the case in the evangelical churches that I knew. And actually, much about this kind of faith seems like a, from a secular perspective, a giant psychotherapy system. And I, I think if it works for you, it's fabulous. How do you explain the huge uh, difference between Europe and the United States as far as religious practice? Many, many people have worried about this. The uh, standard explanation is that the separation of church and state has meant that churches flourished here like, you know, like poppies in a field. Um, it's also true that, um, that you can make the argument that the people who came here were just kind of religious nuts anyway, and that just kind of stuck with us. I mean, Americans really, <laughs> Americans, the Americans who came really, really liked their, their God, and they liked doing God their own way, and arguably that became part of our, our cultural way of being in the world. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I do know that this, this style of intimate Christianity is exploding in Europe. And so this kind of spirituality, and sometimes in other names, um, you'll find it in Anglican churches, you'll find it in Scandinavia. And France has actually this exploding strain of intimate evangelical Christianity. And there are also pagans, you know, the pagan world is exploding, that's another route into an intimate experience of God. So it seems to me that, um, that the God of, of the Bible, and especially you know, Jesus, uh, focuses a lot on social justice and kind of bettering your society, uh, whereas a lot of these evangelicals seem to describe a God that is more concerned with addressing their personal mm -hmm. concerns and their insecurities. Uh, are, there, you know, are there attempts to reconcile this? There is a lot of stuff in the Bible. People read the Bible literally in particular ways. There are certain passages that speak to them and certain you know, understandings of God that seem real to them and others do not. And people tend to read the Bible um, at, not as a way to think about the historical location of Jesus, but as an as a invitation to understand what you should do that afternoon. So you're... You know, you, you know, I sat in prayer group, you know, or in, in house group, reading a passage from Judges, and Judges, uh, and you know, people are saying, "Oh, what does this mean to me?" And, uh, you know, it's 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 very, very, you know, personally driven. You know, what does what does this passage say about whether I should visit my sister? And very concrete and personal. 
That said, Jesus is certainly seen as a revolutionary, somebody who brings change. And that change depends on how you envision change. So you can imagine a Tea Party understanding of change would be quite different from a, what you imagine to be social justice. The particular churches where I spent time on the edges of university towns, you know, they actually did have kind of a social justice mission. Um, they, you know, they would go, you know, for them, it was more likely to be ministering in uh, the prison than it was this, the tip, more typical Catholic feeding the, the homeless kind of outreach. You know, helping a church in, um, in Africa, funding a church, I mean, particularly when churches are planted abroad, they go with a whole expectation that they will be providing medical, medical care and other kinds of care. And then the American church will provide funds to enable them to do that. It depends on what you understand. I mean, so, so there's this resistance to federal handouts um, often goes hand in glove with a sense that um, Jesus asks us to minister, and we should be doing the ministering. We should be offering the help. It is our choice to offer the help. Thank you so much for what is certainly one of the more fascinating discussions here. Thank you. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.